Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. We're having some uh, little technical problems with one of our guests, uh, Judge Nadi Pillay. Uh, welcome to all of you um, who have joined us for the special webinar launch of the, the latest investigation by Open Secrets. And it's titled Profiting from Misery, South Africa's War Crimes in Yemen. Uh, I'd like to extend a very warm uh, welcome to our guests. Uh, Banyan Jamal, who was meant to, to be with us in the room, but is uh, technologically challenged in that area. But she's from the Yemeni organization called Mwanta for Human Rights. And uh, it has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. She's one of our panelists. She'll be able to take questions and make comments on the chat box if you'd like, like to chat to her. Um, she is the voice of, of, of Yemeni people. Um, ah, we have Nabi Pillay's joined us. Welcome, Sorry, welcome, Judge. Welcome, Judge. Uh, we're just introducing, so I'm pleased you have um, mastered the technological challenges we have. Welcome, very much welcome. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure. I uh, just need to mute you for a second. We might have to play a video. Um, Judge, are you able to turn on your video, perhaps? It would be nice to see you, unless it, unless it slows you down. Can you do it, Joanne? Because I don't... All right. Um, all right. Uh, and that, are you able to turn off all your... Right, right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I'm in peace. Yeah. All right. There we go. Lovely. We've got it. We've got it going. Thank you. I'm so pleased you are here. There you are. Lovely to see you. Makes such a difference. Fantastic. Anyway, welcome. Um, also, welcome to, to Judge Pillay, who's just arrived, as I had you scripted, a former High Commissioner for, for Human Rights at the UN from between 2008 and 2014, and of course, Open Secrets researcher and one of the authors of the report, Michael Marchand. To, to many South Africans, uh, Yemen might just be another you know, war-torn country that features in headlines very far away and very remote from South Africa, nothing to do with us. But yet it has a lot to do with us, as this report uh, on South African arms and weapons sales to Yemen uh, or to two countries involved in the conflict in Yemen clearly indicates. Before we, we um, uh, launch into our discussion about what the report reveals and, uh, and, and where we can move from here, we would like to just screen a, a little video uh, from um, Bonyan so that you have a clearer picture of, of what it is um, we're dealing with. Um, and so we'll just tune into that for a, for a second. Hopefully our technical glitches don't bedevil us. And also please feel free, those of you who might have read the, the report already, uh, or the story in the day in Maverick today, to ask any Hello, questions. and thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I am uh, Bunyan Jamal. I'm a lawyer based in Sana'a. I work with Muazana for Human Rights as a, a member of the accountability a member of the accountability and redress team um Muatana is a human rights organization based in all yemen uh, we do documentation of uh, violations of human rights um, against uh, all parties to the yemeni conflict um, we also do legal support in almost all the governorates in Yemen. And um, a lot of our work um, involves uh, um, accountability uh, seeking and um, advocacy. Um, I was uh, very happy that, to hear that uh, Open Secrets are uh, launching this report because it touches upon a very, very important uh, uh, issue that is uh, uh, highly relevant to the conflict in Yemen. Uh, Muadana documented uh, until now, since the beginning of the um, um, military campaign that is led by UAE and uh, KSA, uh, documented uh, more than 500 uh, uh, cases of airstrikes against uh, civilians. Um, these airstrikes targeted uh, schools, uh, houses, uh, hospitals, roads, infrastructure of, of all kinds um, uh, along the, the, the almost six years of, of the war. 
Um, one of the cases that Muwatana documented was uh, an airstrike that happened in Al-Hudaydah in 2016. This uh, strike killed six civilians, a uh, mother and a father and four children. Um, we, we later found out that uh, the, the, the weapons that were used in this strike was um, from the Italian company RWM. Uh, that is a subsidiary of uh, Rheinmetall, the German company. We filed a criminal complaint in 2018 with uh, um, uh, partners uh, like uh, uh, ECCHR, Red Disarmo, BTP Disarmo, and um, 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 uh, um, an Italian law firm. We then um, after we, we, uh, we filed uh, that criminal complaint, we found out that uh, although it's not legal for, for countries like Italy and Germany to, to sell these arms uh, to, to countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE, uh, what they do after uh, embargo, uh, after their own laws stop these um, weapons trade, uh, they open subsidiaries, they open branches. One of the branches was, one of the biggest branches uh, was opened in South Africa. Uh, that's why I think that this report is an important first step and uh, South Africa shouldn't be um, a country where uh, human rights uh, uh, law violators uh, are able to, to run away to. Um, I would, I would like to, to thank Open Secrets for uh, uh, doing this first step and I think it's a very important one. Um, I hope that uh, um, South Africa eventually um, stops the arms trades to Saudi Arabia and UAE uh, on basis of the very apparent human rights violations that are happening. Thank you very, very much for that, uh, Banyanu. It um, is incredibly troubling to us, and I'm very pleased we have this report um, to be able to highlight the role of South African arms companies in these human rights violations. The apartheid government uh, played a significant role in the supply of arms to a number of conflict zones across Africa and elsewhere, and billions was made by the arms companies as these war crimes were committed. And this was all done in secret. There was, there was no way that one could, could trace or track this enormous uh, network of, of, of arms dealings. Dealers post-apartheid, of course, um, uh, the new South Democratic South African government appeared determined to never again allow the arms industry or anyone to operate in secret or to be used in conflicts where human rights violations are clearly committed in, in conflict zones. This is why this investigation is so incredibly important and also um, to ask us to return to what it is we as a country, as a democratic country would like to, how we would like to, what role we would like to play in foreign currency. I'd like, I'd like to begin uh, with, with you, Mike. Um, if you could just talk us through um, what evidence uh, you found in your investigations uh, that South African weapons are actually being used in the war in Yemen and by various sides. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Marion, and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us today. I think that there's two kind of sets, broad sets of evidence that are important to remember whenever we discuss this issue. And the one is the evidence that South Africa and South African weapons companies are regularly exporting weapons to Saudi Arabia and the UAE as, as the main kind of protagonists or external protagonists in the Yemeni civil war. And the evidence for that is in uh, the reports of the arms regulator in South Africa, the National Conventional Arms C Control Committee or the NCACC. And their annual reports show that, that since the war in Yemen has broken out, the proportion of South African weapons going to Saudi Arabia and the UAE have increased. And so during that period, particularly 2015 to 2018, you're looking at between 38 and 49% of all weapons from here going to those states. And so that's 
already indicative of a problem given the human rights records of those states in Yemen, and we can get to that later. But then in addition to that evidence, there's a second layer of evidence which is slightly more specific. And that implicates specific companies whose weapons have been found on the ground. The one we focus on in the report is the evidence that in 2018, there was a mortar attack uh, on the port city of Hodeida in Yemen, and that attack uh, targeted civilians and first responders in the kind of double strike attack that is being criticized by the UN and, and other human rights groups. And two separate investigations have found that the most likely source of those mortars is Rheinmetall Denel Munitions, the South African company owned by Rheinmetall. Um, in Germany, 51%, and Danel, the state-owned arms company, with 49%. And so we focus on that incident, and that is one of approximately five or six incidences where South African weapons have been specifically identified uh, on the ground. We have also found Danel armored vehicles that have been identified as being exported to the UAE in 2016, and then found in the hands of militia forces uh, in Yemen. And so... There's extensive evidence in that regard. Um, and the last thing I'd just end off with there is that, that point about where the weapons are ending up. It's often incredibly difficult to identify precisely where, precisely who is using the weapons, and therein lies part of the problem, is that South Africa has no idea who states like Saudi Arabia and the UAE are passing those weapons onto. That may well be in violation of agreements with South Africa not to on-sell those weapons, but there's extensive evidence on the ground that Saudi Arabia does that as a practice, uh, and therein lies one of the central problems here. Uh, Mark, so, so who, who's, who plays the watchdog role? We know it's the NCAC, or the, the National uh, Conventional Arms Control Council Committee, it's what it's called, and we can talk about what it's, who makes this up and who sits on that committee. And, and uh, so, you know, it's their job to control weapons exports from South Africa. Um, it appears as if it hasn't been fulfilling that function. Um, can you perhaps speak to us about the establishment of the, of the committee and what its role is, who sits on that committee, and what their duties are and, and, and what it is they need to apply when they consider the export of weapons uh, from South Africa? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of its formation, we need to go back to the point that you raised at the beginning, is that the South African, the first democratic regime in South Africa realized that South Africa had become embroiled both in terms of import and export of weapons in this incredibly secretive world, and that the arms industry in South Africa, under the direction of the apartheid state, had operated completely lawlessly. And so, in fact, it is an, a weapons shipment from South Africa to Yemen, in fact, in 1994, created a scandal and precipitated this review. Uh, and then President Mandela established the Cameron Commission to do a review of the industry. And what that really recommended and what it led to in the South African legal framework is the NCACC. It's a quasi, uh, it's a, essentially a quasi cabinet committee. So it's made up of cabinet ministers who sit on it. Up until his untimely death very recently, uh, Minister Jackson Mtembu was head of the NCACC. And the committee then relies on a whole range of departments, the Department of Defense, uh, DERCO is very important, uh, to act in an advisory capacity. But for the purposes of this discussion, the most important thing to note is that by law, the NCACC has to consider a range of things when it decides whether to approve an export and a company in South Africa cannot export weapons without that export permit. The first thing is the likelihood of those weapons being used to commit human rights violations. Linked to that is whether there's a risk of them being used to exacerbate a conflict somewhere. And another very important thing for them to consider is the risk that the export, uh, when the export goes out, it will be passed on to other parties uh, without the agreements as of the South African state. Um, I've seen a lot of comments come up already in the comment box around, you know, what's the evidence that the NCACC ever sits? And I think it is important to state for those listening that the evidence is that the NCACC does sit, it does consider these, these export requests, 
However, there's no evidence that they're applying their mind to what information is in the public domain. And maybe it's important to state that up front, that the NCACC did offer a full and quite comprehensive response to open secrets when we spoke to them, but it really reveals a woefully inadequate approach to their jobs. And so, for example, we specifically asked them whether they have considered the United Nations reports that are in the public domain that implicate Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE in war crimes in Yemen. And their response, quite staggeringly, was that they have not, because Durko has not brought it to their attention. If this is true, I mean, it's indicative of, of a system that's completely failed, but it also seems to make no sense, given that Durko has, at the UN over the last five years, appealed on at least 10 or 11 occasions for the parties in the war to to desist from from war crimes and other violations of international law um, and in 2019 the minister naledi pando actually made a public statement about our need to stand in solidarity with the people of yemen so for the ncacc to say that therefore they have essentially no knowledge uh, of any of the very public information that's out there um, is simply not good enough I think they also said that unless information is brought to them by these other bodies, it seems as if they're this supine uh, committee waiting for someone else to tell them what's, what's happening without, with very little effort put on their part. And what do you think is behind this quite lackadaisical uh, and I think um, you know, quite troubling oversight uh, by, by the committee? So I think that there's a, there are two answers here. The one is an institutional failure that we've seen across the board in the South African states, particularly of, of parliament, to hold the NCACC to account. And so what we've seen from the Defence Committee in Parliament is sporadically MPs have raised the issue, they've chastised the NCACC for not reporting regularly enough, and raise these issues, but there doesn't ever seem to have been a systemic attempt uh, by Parliament to address that. So that, that's the first issue. But the second issue, and it's something that we highlight in the report and that we found, and it is completely unsurprising, is that there is an extensive amount of pressure put on the NCACC by arms companies not to hold up the export of weapons. And if you look at the public statements of Rheinmetall Denal Munitions, they are very clear that the Middle East is one of their most important markets. In 2016, Jacob Zuma attempted the op uh, attended the opening of, of an entire weapons factory set up in Saudi Arabia to produce, amongst other things, the kinds of mortars found being used in Yemen. Um, and it's very clear to RDM that the, their ability to export to Saudi Arabia and the UAE is crucial to their, to their financial well-being. And so when there was a slight holdup in 2018, 2019 uh, in weapons exports, and we can discuss that in greater detail, um, the arms companies kind of almost led by RDM immediately put huge pressure on the NCACC to stop the holdup and to approve exports um, in order to keep the money flowing in. Well, speaking of money, um, we might have spoke earlier on in the, uh, in the green room about the amounts. And I think it's important at this point to just perhaps, you know, uh, enlighten those who have joined us to the amounts. I mean, uh, so uh, South, Africa, South African companies exported to Saudi Arabia weapons uh, worth 2.81 billion and weapons to uh, the UAE worth 4.74 billion. Those are not insignificant amounts. Um, um, Michael, if you could perhaps just talk to us a little bit about um, the role of Rheinmetall uh, Denel Munitions um, and how it came to partner with South Africa and, 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 and why it might have chosen this jurisdiction um, as a place to invest, so to speak. It's such an important question, and it, it's kind of central to what we've tried to uncover in this report as well, Marion, which is this question of are multinational arms corporations who are unable to export from their home countries due to various bans on the export of weapons, particularly to Saudi Arabia, are they using South Africa? In terms of the, the origins of the company, Danel has for various reasons uh, been in extensive financial trouble for many years. And particularly in the mid 2000s, there was a realization that it needed to start spinning off and privatizing or part privatizing large parts of its business. And so it looked for equity partners 
and Rheinmetall Germany, a uh, massive global arms corporation, went into this joint venture with RDM. And so, as I said at the beginning, Rheinmetall owns 51% and Danel a 49% uh, stake. So that's the origin of the, of the company. The really important question is that Rheinmetall, much to their disappointment, is currently unable to export weapons to Saudi Arabia from Germany due to a ban on those arms tran transfers for a range of reasons, uh, uh, ranging all the way from the, the assassination of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi to the concerns around how weapons are being used in Yemen. And so what we've seen, and this is a pattern that activists around the world in the arms trade are concerned about, is suddenly we've seen, and Bonyan's video spoke to this at the beginning, is suddenly Rheinmetall subsidiaries in Italy their re the remnants of their weapons being identified at the sites of airstrikes on civilians in Yemen. And then in 2018, as I referenced at the beginning, the indication that there's a very strong likelihood that RDM mortars were found at the site of a civilian attack as well. Um, and so one of our central questions that we try and raise in this report is not only that there's a failure in South Africa's oversight and governance systems to allow this, but that that failure might be allowing global arms companies to use their subsidiaries in countries like ours to avoid their own domestic arms controls. And indeed also to set up factories or uh, you know, plants where you know, war, the weapons of war are manufactured in other countries itself on piggybacking on South Africa, which is, which is quite frightening to, you know, to say the least. And also Rhein Metall has a history from the Second World War, which you do cover in the report, which I do think is important for people to look at. And I think that's particularly why the German government at its current iteration is so concerned about being implicated in war crimes elsewhere in the world. Um, what response did, did Open Secrets and yourself and the other researchers get from, from Ryan Mattel when, when you questioned them? Because I'm sure you presented your evidence to them. Um, what was their response? So Rheinmetall Denel Munitions, the, the South African company, did offer us a formal response and we'd asked them a range of questions and perhaps uh, as is indicative of many corporations' response to these kind of questions, they declined to answer anything specific and rather chose to offer a blanket response. And that blanket response essentially was that they feel that the South African legal framework is sufficient and that they export with the permission of the NCACC. And I think maybe just to put that on record, that there's no indication that we have that that is not true. Uh, the problem, of course, lies in the fact that the NCACC is granting them um, those permits. The, the slightly harder questions that we asked them, they have not gone on record on. And so one of the most important things was that we did ask them, have you investigated in any way the evidence that some of your weapons were found at the site of the civilian attack? Uh, they did not respond to that, and we did follow up with them to ask for a very specific response to that question, and up until now, we haven't received a response. Um, and so, refusing, they are refusing to, to be drawn on some of those specifics, but also just as a last point on, on that kind of general response, is that it is, uh, it's remarkable that RDM would put such extraordinary pressure on the NCACC to stop uh, to stop any holdup on the export of weapons to those countries while simultaneously holding up the legal framework as some kind of world-beating model when all the evidence suggests that that is, that is just simply not the case. Um, I just want to sort of welcome everybody who's joined us. We're, we're, we're having a bit of technical problems with Judge Navi Pillay. I'm not sure. We will, we, I'll be asking your questions just now in case people are wondering why the judge is, is on the one panel and not speaking at the moment. I will get to the judge in a moment and hopefully technology won't fail us. Uh, two, uh, two more last questions, uh, or one last question, perhaps, or two. Um, the end user t certificates. Um, uh, matter. You know, there, there seems to have been an, an interesting. Uh, what is the role of end users for certificates in the final granting of a permit to these companies uh, to export arms to conflict ridden zones? So, an end user certificate uh, in its simplest form is simply a, a guarantee by the purchaser that they will not 
on-sell or pass on any of the weapons they buy without the permission of the seller. And so in this case, it would be a legal commitment by Saudi Arabia, for example, that they will not pass on any weapons they purchase from South Africa uh, without permission. And an end-user certificate must be signed by any state purchasing weapons from South Africa. That is part of, of the requirement by law. Um, I've referenced several times in the discussion so far the slight holdup in weapons to Saudi Arabia and the UAE over 2018 and 2019. And that all centered around the end user certificate. And it speaks to the importance of this question of where the weapons end up. In 2017, the South African officials took a clause that had always been in the end user certificates and moved it to a slightly more prominent position. And what that clause was, was that it concerned inspections. It, it, it essentially concerned the rights of South Africa's officials to travel to those countries to inspect weapons as part of the check process that they are not being passed on. And what is so interesting is that when that happened, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, amongst one or two other states, immediately refused to sign them. And this created uh, a massive uproar in the industry, companies like RDM, uh, were very, very upset because it was holding up uh, the exports. And so what we've written in the report and what we continue to argue is that this was really the opportunity for the NCACC to say, well, actually, this is where we draw the line. Our, li our law is clear. And if you're going to say that you cannot abide by these requirements around inspections, we're actually going to stop the exports. And unfortunately, it's the opposite of what happened. What seems to have happened is that behind closed doors, the NCACC and the arms industry came to an agreement to amend that requirement. They have now changed it to an incredibly um, nebulous term, which is that inspections will be done by diplomatic process. We asked the NCACC what this meant, and unfortunately we haven't received any kind of clarity on what that would mean. All we do know is that the minute that that change to the end user certificate was made, all of those states were very happy to proceed once again. Um, and when that happened, we also received a confirmation from the Minister of Defense that South Africa has only ever conducted one inspection in the last 25 years in the wow. democratic era on where those weapons end up. And so again, it, it speaks to this notion um, that there is really no way whatsoever for the South African officials to know where those weapons are ending up in Yemen. And the law requires them to take that into account when approving exports. And so for them to continue doing so with all of the evidence at hand that those weapons are being used um, seems to be a clear violation of those legal requirements. Um, what needs to happen then um, for us to end South Africa's kind of complicity and collaboration with uh, what clearly are war crimes? And I just want to sort of mention that the conflict in Yemen is quite complicated, and it's a domestic conflict which has had, uh, which has gained international dimensions. Of course, where there is conflict, of course, the arms dealers run. So, if you want to get to the bottom of that uh, conflict itself, it, it is in the report, and it's extensively reported. You can see who the various sides are, and who supports whom, just in case people feel um, difficult. But what needs to happen um, to end this, to stop South Africa from being complicit? In, in, in the injuring and maiming and killing of Yemeni citizens? So I think that there are one or two direct things that we've called for in the report that are kind of short-term solutions. And so one that we are calling for most obviously is that the NCACC should immediately cease approving these export permits to these states based on this evidence. We think there is sufficient concern now in this report and in a range of other public documents to say that those permits should be stopped and that really they should consider uh, revoking all existing permits to stop the weapons leaving South Africa for those, for those states. Um, we also think that that's for, on the side of the NCACC. The other side is, is from DERCO, and DERCO plays, you know, our international relations and cooperation ministry plays such an important role here, both in terms of advising the NCACC, but also in stamping the way our foreign policy must be enacted. And so they've released a whole host of documents that on paper commit the South African state to abiding by international law and human rights, but we're not seeing that in practice. And it's really time for the ministry to actually make that a, a priority. 
Uh, to return to your point about war crimes, and I mean, Judge Pele would be much better place to speak to this, but we have also called for our authorities, uh, the Hawks and others tasked and mandated with investigating war crimes, that they should be considering the evidence against companies uh, implicated in these types of crimes, um, and to consider any legal liability that our companies have for continuing to supply the capability and the weapons to those states. We think that's important. And the, and the final thing is a slightly broader point which we make, which is that South Africans, both civil society and the public more broadly, I think needs to stand in solidarity with people in Yemen. We hope that the report is a very small part of bringing this conversation more into the fore in South Africa and to say, as you said at the beginning, that while it may seem very far off, we have made ourselves, we've become deeply implicated in this. Um, and we need to put pressure on our officials to stop it. Uh, as a final point, I would say that just looking at the comments coming up in the, uh, you know, in the feed, it is really important to remember that there are a whole host of more structural issues at play here. The, the failure of parliament, for, exa for example, is one of those things. And so those are all things that would be part of a longer term solution. Good. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mark. We, we, I see there are questions um, coming in, and I'll ask them a bit later. Judge Pillay, thank you very much. I'm sorry you've had so many terrible technical glitches. Um, are you with us, and can you hear me? And and um, am I able to proceed with a few questions I'd like to ask you around the human rights yes. violations? Thank you, Marion, and thank you, Mark. Well, the, you know, I had the chance to look at the pre-published uh, report. Uh, really salute you for your team and you for encouraging in investigating this. You know, I was High Commissioner for Human Rights when uh, we saw the interference by Saudi Arabia when they removed the President Saleh to safety. But they haven't stopped interference. So although I, I always had to act in terms of human rights, I agree with you that Foreign Affairs and DERCO has a crucial role to play because they deliver wonderful rhetoric outside there in the UN and everywhere else, uh, and yet continue to violate and, and uh, do nothing about the abuse of human rights in Yemen. And so I'm familiar with UN reports on your Yemen. They really well supported, uh, particularly uh, uh, what you have in your report on fragments motor fragments being found in the attack on the port city of Hodeida. And uh, that has a label of that factory that uh, Zuma opened in Saudi Arabia. Now, it's, of course, it's very, very hard for outsiders, including you and investigators, to find the link, to find the empirical evidence that actually follows the route of uh, from the supplier, with in this case South Africa and uh, RDM. If may, uh, uh, Judge, if I may just step in here, just to, I would like you to continue on this trade, but let's just um, focus slightly on uh, we as South Africans who are watching this um, and who have voted uh, for this government, which has its particular focus on uh, on the constitution and on human rights and on human dignity, and that we would never again be part of, of, of anything to do with those kind of violations. But what are uh, the human rights obligations of a post-apartheid South Africa, and particularly in relation to the war crimes in Yemen. Uh, can the country be held responsible? What are our obligations? All right, so we're very clear about our national obligations. They spelled out in our constitution. The Cameron Commission uh, established the obligations of our government. So nationally, the NCACC shouldn't wait until somebody else investigated. They have to proactively, they, the parliament, the government, have to proactively implement our constitutional guarantees against human rights abuse in our own country and outside our borders. With regard to international obligations, yes, firstly, there's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that South Africa has been a party for a very long time. And there's, there are provisions there where they have to ensure, for instance, in this case, um, arms sales that they do not reach uh, the ha in, into hands of people who are going to use these uh, weapons against civilians. And, he, and when I was High Commissioner for Human Rights, it was South Africa, together with some developing countries who fought such a battle 
to get an amendment into the arms treaty. The amendment was being opposed by major arms uh, supply countries, including Norway, which has a good reputation for human rights. So I was very proud that South Africa and some developing countries won the amendment, which said they have to conduct, all suppliers have to conduct due diligence to ensure that the arms they are supplying are not being used uh, against ordinary people and causing human rights violations. So a clear uh, undertaking that they not only pushed for, they undertook. There is plenty under in international law. I know I, I sat as a judge in the International Criminal Court. I think it would be very important to bring not only this report of open society, but the UN reports in the form of a complaint to the prosecutor of the ICC to investigate because South Africa is a member of that court. Judge, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, comment or suggestion you've just made. I thought of it earlier on. Um, are you saying that South Africa as a country, as a signatory to this treaty, that it would be possible for the country to be tried at the International Criminal Court for war crimes um, should someone lay a complaint? This is legally possible? Marion, I mentioned the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court because it's just that court that has the jurisdiction to try criminal cases such as war crimes. But in the arms treaty, they all have their own uh, supervisory bodies where complaints can be addressed to them. Violations of a treaty by a member state are addressed by them. It may not be, end up as a criminal prosecution, but they have remedies for this. We have to bring this to their attention, violations internationally. Uh, what are the remedies? Um, is there a punitive, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering because it seems that while on paper everything sort of exists to try and combat and stop this, and we've signed these treaties, and what if there is a sanction, you know, what, would, what, what could this be in terms of how South Africa would be punished for its role? Well, many of the international treaties, unfortunately, don't provide for remedies, sanctions, and penalties because just getting the right in there is such a hard-worn fight, for instance, uh, the provision of due diligence to ensure that you, you personally check uh, that, you, that you, the arms you supply do not fall to be used against people. So that is a hard fought thing. The only uh, remedy we have at the moment is to ask for the in inquiry before the bodies established under those uh, treaties, which may help uh, end up in uh, a call for immediate cessation of the supply of arms. Uh, uh, Judge, can, Judge, can I just ask, you know, um, what are the human rights obligations of, let's say, private or state-owned arms companies that are based in South Africa, um, especially as we know that there is uh, quite strong evidence that these have been used against civilians uh, in, in terrible attacks in Yemen. I'm glad you asked that, Marion, because a few years ago we didn't have that. And actually, I was the High Commissioner for Human Rights when the Human Rights Council adopted the uh, Business and Human Rights Guidelines. So those are the guidelines, and very many uh, companies are implementing that. They have to have a policy, a stated policy and commitment for the protection of human rights, that all the corporate activities must be governed uh, with human rights protections in mind. So that's the um, document. It's not binding on corporations, but so many of them now are eager to support this. You know, I'm working on um, the right to privacy and digital surveillance, for instance, and all these same principles come in there with regard to corporations. So, uh, bringing, yeah, bringing to the international fora the open uh, society's investigation. Open secrets. <laughs> but I, I, we know what you mean. I just think that they wouldn't like necessarily us to confuse open society with open secrets. But... Oh, yeah. um, Yes, yes. So, so, um, so there are obligations set uh, on, on these private companies. I'm, I'm just curious as to how companies like, or countries like Germany, 
are able to, and we know about the Second World War, and particularly Ryan Mattel, Danelle, and the history there, uh, how have companies like, or countries like Germany, and I think Italy, enforced um, laws which prohibit the sale of these weapons? They seem to have been able to, to do this really well, which is why it sent uh, these companies to, to softer touch jurisdictions. And then my other question is then, there must be some political cachet or financial reward to a government. Um, it seems that that might be an underlying issue uh, for the lack of uh, ability to implement those laws and those mechanisms that, are, that exist in South Africa's democratic constitution. What is the, what is the motive for the lackadaisical response, do you think, if you can speculate on that? Well, if we take the German laws, which prohibit uh, Rheinmetall from selling arms directly to Saudi Arabia and UAE, so in Germany they will implement that law and they will uh, criminalize any contraventions. If they, Germany has not taken action against outsiders with whom uh, Rheinmetall has formed joint ventures. So that's a gap in implementation there. And that can be pursued by human rights activists in Germany and also by others by asking the question. Why are they lackadaisical? As you gave the figures about billions of profits and the power and pressure exerted by arms companies here. And now this is precisely why we have the international regime protecting human rights, why we have our constitution protect, protecting human rights, precisely because governments should not give in to, the, to this pressure. That's why the, those rules are there. So they can't now say, oh no, we have to protect this industry, it's giving us billions of, uh, uh, of brands into our country, job creation, and the usual song. The bottom line is you have to implement the human rights obligations that you have undertaken. And, and the crux, crux comes when you get these pressures from big business. I mean, it's interesting if you look at the report as well, that the biggest supplier of, uh, of arms to Saudi Arabia and the UAE is, of course, the United States. And I think Donald Trump took out some chart at some point and, you know, uh, showed American voters and uh, also the UK, which is so interesting. At one point, the United Kingdom used to export cotton and cars. And now I think one of its major exports. And you have to hold in mind, why do these countries do this? Are lethal weapons and some of them technologically abominably advanced where you know there are cluster bombs that just cause so much uh, damage to people uh, and that south africa should find themselves or find ourselves um in the same company uh with 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 very little impunity is, is is very disturbing and i think um that's why this report is so important and as you say the opportunities exist for for civil society and people to pressure the south african government not to do this um and you know uh, Mary, it's because big big governments, powerful governments like the U.S. violate these international obligations with impunity that other countries would copy them and they would say, uh, India once told me, well, when the U.S. stops this, then we will stop. And, and when I was High Commissioner, I condemned even President Obama for signing those assassination contracts, these drone attacks and remote attacks that kill civilians in Yemen. Uh, and nothing happened. They, they got away with it. So the danger and the risk is that countries like South Africa follow the, those uh, bad examples of Trump and, and leaders before him because there's impunity. Well, it's um, ironic because these were the very countries that, in a sense, uh, often sided with the apartheid government in those days. As much as they say they don't, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were very instrumental in delaying uh, you know, whatever transformation was meant to occur in South Africa. Uh, Judge Pillow, where, where do we uh, ultimately locate accountability, legally and in terms of human rights? Where, if it's possible in South Africa, where do we locate it? Who acted in 1994 when the disclosure of, of weapons to, you said the uh, Yemen mark, you know, sitting as a judge on the Rwanda Tribunal, and the forensic evidence revealed the motor fragment with the arm score label. 
and everyone in that court turned to look at me. So they hold all South Africans responsible. This is why civil society is so alarmed by this. Who has the responsibility? Our governments, obviously. And President Mandela reacted fast in April 1994 with the very aim that we uh, abide by this. And I see that the uh, NCAC's uh, own um, priority is, you know, their preamble is clearly protection of human rights and they're not delivering on this so they've got a good framework a legal framework all the rhetoric and promises uh however it's become a world without rules uh as as uh, the cameron commission found with regard to armsco yeah yeah these are, these are major failures on the part of of the government we just we fed up of rhetoric we fed up of wonderful institutions set up but we cannot accept the secrecy surrounding all this the, the lack of accountability we want to know who gets appointed to these bodies do they have the proper qualifications is you know do they get appointed simply because of political affiliations and then it becomes a club of secrecy and then you need huge efforts such as open secrets to to dig this out and even they have struggled it's amazing you as you quite rightly said that the answer they got from the then head of ncacc oh well we'll investigate if someone brings it to our notice not so they have to the government has to send a send a message and act on the principle that they have to proactively implement human rights protections and constitutional guarantees against abuse. So as I said, we've got the framework nationally and internationally. Uh, it always troubles me that um, so much is left to civil society and the media to expose this. Uh, but the UN uh, Human Rights uh, Council and, and other investigators are also playing a key role because they have the resources to carry out investigations such as this on the ground. That kind of work will continue, Marion. So violators are not going to get away. That's good to know. Thank you very much, Judge. I've got a few questions here from, from our many, many uh, viewers, and I'm uh, pleased that some of you are. David LePage is asking a follow-up question. What on the ground human rights experience, if any, is represented on the NCACC. I'm not sure, Michael, I might have called you Mark earlier, but uh, apologies, I'm flying a plane. Um, uh, um, is, is, is there any representation on the NCACC? Uh, no, there, there's no clear evidence that there is. And that's another thing that's one of the problems here is that it seems that the NCACC is relying heavily on other ministries. And it's, it's unclear which of those ministries has the louder voice. So, for example, two of the important ministries that they rely on is the Department of Defense and the State Security Agency. Um, and purportedly, DERCO. We've already said that DERCO, their stated, uh, their stated commitments uh, don't match up with any input into the NCACC process. But it is one of the issues. And I think in the longer run, one of the other kind of systemic things that needs to be addressed is the regularity of the reporting by the NCACC, how much detail that's in those reports, and also ultimately the, the public access to the deliberation processes and the decisions that are being made on a more ongoing basis. Because I think that's the way to really introduce the type of scrutiny. What we've got used to over the last 10 years is accessing the NCACC reports six months to 18 months after the fact, and then scrambling to work out what's happened. Um, so it, it's a, it is a significant problem. Hmm. Yeah, may I, Marion, just comment on that sure. here? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, so of course, Michael, you're right. I, serve, I served on the McLanta parliamentary investigation, and one of the recommendations to parliament is that they receive multi-presentation uh, from different departments, not just one. So this would be a case where many ministries are involved, like you just said, well, they have to make joint reports to Parliament. That's one of the recommendations, and I thought they were beginning to implement that. Well, I think we have been seeing at the, at the, the Zonda Commission Interstate Capture that 
you know, there has been a significant period of time where there has been a failure of oversight in Parliament. And I think what is important about this report is that it shows South Africans, um, and I spoke earlier to Michael as well about footage I'd seen in Syria of what Syrians uh, put up with, with the bombing there. It, it, it is worse than purgatory and it is, it is worse than hell. And I think until we are able to see um, the devastation caused, I mean, the attack on the port cut off uh, food supply, water supply, and uh, Michael, if you could just talk to the numbers of people in, in Yemeni at the moment um, and, and what has happened to, to Yemenis as a result of these, this ongoing civil war and our role in it. I, it's really important to remember, as you say, that the, the impact on people in Yemen, uh, and this is something that Moatana, uh, Bonyan's organization, has, has spoken to over, over many years, is that it's not simply about attacks on civilians that kill civilians, but it's about the complete destruction of, of infrastructure that people rely on for life. And so you have uh, very simple diseases like cholera absolutely taking over. And it's estimated currently that up to 16 million people in Yemen simply cannot access enough food, that you have millions of people uh, in that country that, that quite literally face the risk of starvation over the next year. And so I, I don't think that the, the kind of human catastrophe there can't be overstated. I, I do want to point out something else that is a cruel irony about the way the world is respons responding to Yemen, is that there is currently an ongoing global discussion about raising money for aid relief in Yemen and all sorts of discussions about whether the British government is giving enough and whether this government is giving enough. And it is the same countries that are flooding the conflict with weapons and allowing those parties to continue to wreak devastation that are then saying, well, over the last 10 years, we've put aside a billion pounds for aid, and so we're, we're contributing to the issue. Um, and we really need to move past that discussion. This notion that the international community can patch what's happening in Yemen by sending food parcels is not addressing the role of that community in exacerbating the conflict. And that's for all countries from South Africa to, to the larger contributors like the US and the UK to actually grapple with their role there. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Judge, Judge Bile, do you have some final words? Uh, I mean, the point that the arms industry exists at all, of course, is at the at the bottom of this, and we, we look at South Africa's poisoned talus, you know, with the arms deal here. Um, in a sense, you know, the arms deal is the biggest threat to human safety globally, um, and and where there is trouble, uh, countries go, and that some sort of sanction must be seen to be done. Um, if you have some parting words for us about um, what do we do in a world awash with arms dealers and people who don't care. Uh, about who dies in the crossfire or who gets involved. Um, so I just want to also add to Michael Zimoff. You know, uh, Kofi Annan was once appointed by the, the same powers to mediate over Syria. And so what he said to me in respect of Syria and Yemen, that the very people who set up these institutions such as these peace mechanisms are the ones who are pulling the rug under him with, with the arms race and so on. So there is that level of duplicity outside there, a very high political level. Uh, with regard to, um, and of course one can appeal to for greater intervention from the EU because they are very concerned about the placement of people and the refugee flows into Europe. So they have their own interest in intervening to protect uh, to protect the people of Yemen. With us, let me come down to us. But actually, we're very fortunate in that we are, are in a democracy. We have rules, we have the constitution, and we have mechanisms. We have to insist that these function. South Africa's laws and courts can look into factors such as a joint venture where we're helping this German company to violate the law in Germany by using us. So I'm very hopeful that we, you know, we're much further than most other countries where we can get scrutiny and so on. Yeah. I have to turn to something. Um, so
So, uh, you know, uh, I'm hopeful, A, that we, we have empirical evidence dug up by very hardworking people. We work with the NGOs who are struggling on the ground because that uh, actively shows our the support of South Africans to them. We should vehemently object to the use of taxpayers' money here from South Africa being used to kill people outside. Uh, not only kill people, but destroying their livelihood and everything. Um, so I think we are in a strong position to pursue uh, calls for accountability here in South Africa. Thank you very much for that, Judge Shafile. I've got one minute left. Uh, Michael, do you have any parting comments? Um, I, I think that the the report should be engaged it's by people who have uh, joined this webinar launch. It is launching today. Um, it's very disturbing. Um, but your parting uh, words to us around what you hope will will result from from this hard work over a year's worth of work. Sorry, just unmuting. The, I'll end off with a classic 2021 moment. Um, <laughs> it's to say that I think, first of all, I would encourage everyone to download and engage with the report. There are some companies and cases that we haven't been able to get to today. And I do want to stress that it's a broader systemic issue. I think in terms of what we want to see, it's two fundamental points. The one, and this is the most obvious, is that we have to keep the pressure up. The NCACC needs to stop approving weapons exports to Saudi Arabia and the UAE now, as soon as possible, to stop these weapons entering into the Yemeni conflict. And then the second thing is a slightly broader project, which is the realization that the more this goes on, the more global arms companies are going to realize South Africa is a jurisdiction that they can use to avoid controls elsewhere. And I think we must resist the pushback from the arms industry, which is going to say that that's a worthwhile payoff to make for industry and jobs in South Africa. I don't think it's a choice that we as a state have to make or want to make, to make ourselves complicit in the very worst of crimes uh, for the sake of the profit of, of a few companies. Thank you very much to both the guests and to our guest who I hope was uh, online from Yemen but had problems, uh, um, Bonyan Jamal. Thank you very much for your video. Thank you very much for being a voice for the Yemeni people. Thank you, Judge Pile, for your time and uh, apologies for the technical glitches. They have nothing to do with you. And Michael, congratulations to Open Secrets and the team for a very important, um, disturbing uh, report and I'm hoping that South Africans will respond as we always have done to the violations of human rights um, anywhere in the world. So thank you very much to everybody for coming and for those of you who have attended this webinar this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you thank so much. Bye-bye.